The 5th of May, 1980. Masked men storm the Iranian embassy in the heart of London in the glare of the world's television cameras. Their mission? To rescue hostages seized by Iraqi terrorists. For the first time ever, the British Army's elite Special Air Service Regiment is seen in action. Inside the building, the SAS cleared each room using carefully pre-planned drills. In the road outside, other SAS men watched for anyone attempting to escape from the building and checked for any explosive devices that the terrorists might have planted. Within 10 minutes, the surviving hostages had been rescued and all the terrorists accounted for. This may have seemed a far cry from the deserts of Egypt and Libya, where the SAS cut its teeth during World War II. But the techniques it developed during its raids on Axis airfields and supply dumps were put to good effect, not just during the Iranian embassy siege, but also in its operations during the 1982 Falklands War, especially the raids on the Argentinian airstrip on Pebble Island and in the 1991 Gulf War. In the summer of 1941, the British and Dominion forces in Egypt were stalemated. Earlier in the year, they had triumphantly driven the Italians out of Saranaika, the westernmost province of Libya. The Italian 10th Army had been destroyed and tens of thousands of prisoners fell into British hands. But Hitler had then sent General Erwin Rommel and the Africa Corps to help his Italian ally. Rommel wasted little time. Within six weeks of arriving, he attacked, driving the British back into Egypt. Efforts to dislodge Rommel in the early summer of 1941 failed, and the British suffered heavy tank casualties. The only encouraging fact was that although under close siege, the garrison of the Libyan port of Tobruk continued to hold out against the Axis forces. During the stalemate, a 24-year-old commando officer, David Sterling, lay in hospital in Alexandria. He was recovering from injuries caused by a parachute jump that went wrong. Sterling had plenty of time to think about why the war in the Middle East seemed to be deadlocked and how this could be broken. One of the most notable factors about the war in the Western Desert was the immense distances that needed to be covered. The distance from Tripoli, where the Africa Corps had landed, to Alexandria, the main British base, was over a thousand miles. There were few proper roads, and to the south was an open flank of desert which could be navigated by experienced troops. Sterling realized that this made Rommel's supply lines particularly long and vulnerable. So too were the Africa Corps airfields and supply dumps. Attempts to disrupt them through commando raids from the sea had failed because Axis forces were too alert. Also, the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet could not spare the ships for major amphibious operations. Its priority was to keep the still powerful Italian fleet at bay. The Navy was also struggling to keep Tobruk, 
as well as the strategically important island of Malta, supplied in the face of constant Axis air attacks from both Italy and North Africa. Sterling concluded that a possible alternative was small groups of men which would be infiltrated through the Axis lines. Not only would the enemy find it more difficult to detect them, but they were capable of causing as much damage to supply dumps and airfields as larger bodies. For his raiding force to be effective, Sterling believed that it must be responsible for its own training and be directly answerable to the Commander-in-Chief Middle East. He also proposed that his force should be sent in by parachute and operate in conjunction with any future British offensive. Once out of hospital, Sterling decided that if he had submitted his proposal through normal channels, it would merely get lost in the bureaucracy that was headquarters Middle East. He decided that a direct approach to the very top was the only way to get his ideas considered. Sterling therefore went in person to General Neil Ritchie, the Deputy Chief of Staff of Headquarters Middle East, and handed him his pencil-written memorandum. Ritchie was impressed. He assured Sterling that he would show it in person to the Commander-in-Chief, General Sir Claude Auchinleck. Auchinleck also liked Sterling's ideas and authorized him to recruit a force of six officers and 60 soldiers from the commandos in the Middle East. Thus, the SAS was born. David Sterling now had his commander-in-chief's approval for his special force. Next, he needed a name for it and to choose his man. The name was the idea of Brigadier Dudley Clark, who was in charge of deception operations in the Middle East. It arose out of a plan to convince the Axis that the British had a large airborne force in the area. Sterling's 66 officers and men were rather grandly titled L Detachment Special Air Service Brigade. Sterling's recruitment methods were informal. He was looking for men who could cope with the sort of deep penetration warfare he had in mind. Among his first recruits was his fellow guardsman, Captain Jock Lewis, a born organizer. Lewis had already gained considerable experience of carrying out raiding operations from Tobruk. Another was the pre-war Irish rugby football international, Blair Paddy Main, who was always thirsting for a fight. Main had operated with number 11 commando during the recent campaign against the Vichy French in Syria. Many of the other founder members of the SAS were guardsmen who had been in Sterling's commando. Sterling had not been given anywhere for his new force to base itself, so the SAS's first task was to steal a camp from a New Zealand unit which was at the front. After this act of piracy, Sterling imposed strict brigade of guards discipline. Parachute training for all SAS members was a priority, but Sterling had to improvise his own training equipment. He then had to persuade the RAF to lend him an elderly Bombay transport aircraft from which his recruits could complete their training. Aware that his men would be operating deep behind enemy lines, Sterling insisted that they become experts on German and Italian weapons. From the start, the SAS was obsessed with being the toughest of the tough. And, as David Sterling later explained, its methods and organization were very different from more conventional army units. The whole purpose of the SAS was to be able to live for long periods behind the lines. Whereas the smallest uh, unit 
in the commando was uh, 12 men. In the case of the SAS, each troop should be divided down to two subunits of four men. And that each should be capable of operating by itself. We were a totally strategic type unit. One man would know a particular amount of navigation. Another would be fully trained in medical side. Another would have his specialist learning in explosives and every form of sabotage and so on. Each of them were equally capable of doing any task. The magic of having four men was that it wasn't commanded by any particular one of them. The SAS's winged dagger cap badge was designed by Sergeant Bob Tate. The motto, Who Dares Wins, was Sterling's own invention and aptly summed up the aim of the new unit. The SAS soon had an opportunity to prove itself. The British were preparing to go over to the offensive. Auchinleck was planning a major assault, Operation Crusader, for November 1941 which would relieve Tobruk and drive Rommel out of Saranaika. The SAS was to be dropped two nights before the attack and raid Axis airfields in the areas of Tamimi and Gazala. They would then place demolition charges on as many aircraft as possible. Once they had carried out their attacks, Sterling and his men needed to be extricated and brought back to the British lines. He decided that this was an ideal task for the long-range desert group, which had been formed in June 1940 as an intelligence gathering unit. The LRDG used its skills at navigation and survival to take advantage of the open desert flank to the south of the desert battlefield to get behind the Axis lines. They would use the same method to collect the SAS after the raid. On the evening of the 16th of November, 1941, Sterling and his men were gathered at a forward airfield in Egypt. The weather was not good, with a sandstorm brewing. But Sterling was determined to go ahead with the operation. Five Bombay aircraft, each containing an SAS group, took off. The first operation did not go well. Because of the sandstorm, the drop was scattered and much equipment lost. The airfield attacks had to be aborted, and only three out of the five groups made it to the rendezvous. The remaining 34 men were captured. An LRDG patrol duly collected the survivors and took them to an oasis at Jalan, behind Axis lines, but deep in the desert to lick their wounds. Sterling himself returned to Cairo, fearing that he might be ordered to disband his unit. But he found that the British headquarters was preoccupied with more pressing matters. This gave the SAS another chance to prove itself. For on the morning of the 18th of November, 1941, while Sterling and his men were waiting to meet up with the long-range desert group, the main British attack on Irvin Rommel and his Axis forces had opened. It did not go quite as planned. The British armour became involved in bitter tank battles with heavy casualties on both sides. Rommel also created confusion through a sudden thrust aimed at destroying British forward supply dumps. But running short of fuel, he was forced to withdraw. Auchinleck, seeing his opportunity to lift the siege of Tobruk, ordered a fresh attack. Brigadier Dennis Reed, with a motorized column, 
met up at Jalo with David Sterling and his SAS men. Reed received orders to move north and link up with the main attack near Benghazi. He asked Sterling to attack the airfield at Agadabia. An enthusiastic Sterling enlarged the plan to include attacks on airfields at El Aghela, Serte, and Tamit. The LRDG would take the SAS to their targets. Paddy Main and his team were able to infiltrate Serte without being spotted and proceeded to destroy no less than 37 aircraft. After running out of bombs, he dealt with his last one by climbing into the cockpit and wrenching out the instrument panel. The SAS also had success at El Aguela, destroying a number of aircraft. But Sterling was foiled by mines at Tamit, and Jock Lewis found no planes at Agadabia. The Allied assault relieved Tobruk, and Rommel began to withdraw his forces from Cyrenaica. Encouraged by the success of his airfield raids in support of Dennis Reed's advance, Sterling launched a further series of attacks over the Christmas period against Axis airfields. But none of the SAS teams was able to penetrate the German and Italian defences, and the long-range desert group patrol with whom Jock Lewis was operating came under attack from Italian aircraft. Tragically, Lewis, whom Sterling regarded as his right-hand man, was killed. With Rommel driven back into Tripolitania, Sterling returned to Cairo and obtained Orkinlek's backing to recruit further men. Among them was a free French troop under Commandant Berger and a young officer from the Cameron Highlanders, Fitzroy Maclay who would later lead the British military mission to Tito in Yugoslavia. On the 22nd of January 1942, Rommel struck again, driving the British back to Gazala. As the British retreated, the SAS carried out two attacks on the port of Benghazi and nearby airfields. These had mixed success. Benina had no aircraft, Slanta was too heavily defended, and only one was destroyed at Basi. The main airstrip of Berka could not be found, but Paddy Main was able to attack an adjoining strip. Rommel attacked once more at the end of May, driving the British back into Egypt after five weeks of fierce fighting. This meant that Malta could again be attacked from Axis bases in North Africa, as well as Italy and Greece. The SAS was instructed to raid these airfields, together with one on the island of Crete, which was assigned to the Free French. Carried out in mid-June, these attacks again met with varying success. Despite this, the SAS was now proving itself a valuable weapon in the desert war. Axis troops were well aware of its existence, and increasing numbers were being detached to step up airfield security and guard supply dumps. By now, the British 8th Army had fallen back to the El Alamein line. This was the last defensible system before the Suez Canal, since its southern flank was not open, but rested on the Katara Depression, which lay below an escarpment and was virtually impassable to vehicles. The British succeeded in preventing Rommel from breaking through, but were unable to drive him back. As the fighting continued, Sterling was looking at ways of increasing the effectiveness of the SAS. The general pattern was that its raids would be mounted during the moonless period of each month. Then the raiders would be brought back to base by the long-range desert group to prepare for the next one. Sterling decided that this wasted time, and that if his men could subsist on their own in the desert for weeks at a time, they could mount many more raids. But to do this, the SAS needed its own transport. Sterling already had a stripped-down forward shooting brake, known as the Blitz Buggy, which he took on raids, painting it grey so that it could pass as a German staff car. He now managed to acquire some Willys Jeeps, 
which had just been sent to the Middle East by the Americans and had an excellent cross-country capability. These were modified, some with pairs of Vickers K.303 inch machine guns. Others were given an even heavier armament. A 0.5 inch Browning machine gun together with a single Vickers K in the front and twin Vickers in the rear of the Jeep. Sterling reckoned that with this armament he could attack Axis aircraft without having to dismount. The chassis was also strengthened and extra fuel tanks installed. A water condenser was also fitted on the front. With the modifications completed, the SAS was ready for action once more. It was ordered to strike forward Axis landing grounds in support of an attack that Orkinlek was mounting at El Alamein. Sterling and his men slipped around the desert flank, negotiating their way along the escarpment of the Katara depression. They then met up with an LRDG patrol, which was to guide them to their targets. One group, led by Sterling and Maine, attacked the airfield at Bagush. They simply drove down rows of parked aircraft, blazing away with their Brownings and Vickers K machine guns, which were loaded with a mixture of incendiary, explosive and tracer rounds. Such was the surprise they achieved that not a single shot was fired at them. The other groups found their airfields more heavily guarded, but also managed to destroy some aircraft. At the end of July 1942, Sterling carried out a massed raid on Sidi Hanesh airfield near Fuka airfield with his jeeps. Forty aircraft were destroyed. The SAS's new tactics were clearly working. Following the success of its new tactics against Rommel's forces massed in front of El Alamein, the SAS was ordered back to its base at Kubrit in Egypt. Dramatic changes had just taken place in the command structure of the Middle East, following a visit in early August by Prime Minister Winston Churchill. He had decided that Orkinlek was exhausted and replaced him by General Sir Harold Alexander. General Bernard Montgomery was given command of the 8th Army. Sterling feared that as a result, the SAS might lose its independence. But he was able to meet Churchill and convince him of his plans to expand the SAS and launch more raids. The unit's future was therefore secure. Sterling was now ordered to raid the port of Benghazi once more to disrupt Rommel's supply line across the Mediterranean from Europe. He set up a forward base at Kufra, an oasis in southern Libya which had long been used by the LRDG. From there, his men set out on the 4th of September. The attack was a disaster. It was supposed to take place under cover of an RAF bombing raid on the port, but the raiders were late and it was almost over when they reached the town. The garrison was on full alert and a fierce firefight developed in which at least one jeep was set on fire. The SAS were forced to withdraw and for the next two days the team was repeatedly attacked from the air. 25 vehicles were destroyed. The remainder managed to reach Jalo, 
where they found enough fuel to get them back to Kufra. However, the SAS was not blamed for this failure. And at the end of September 1942, L Detachment was enlarged to become one SAS regiment with four combat squadrons. Sterling himself was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Montgomery was now planning to take the offensive at El Alamein. The SAS role would be to attack Rommel's lines of communication. Throughout the subsequent battle at El Alamein and the pursuit of Rommel that followed, the SAS mounted a series of raids from its desert base at Kufra against the Axis lines of communication. One striking incident involved Private David Silito. During an attack on the railway near Sidi Barani, Silito's vehicle was shot up and he found himself alone with just a water bottle and compass. He set out on foot to rejoin his unit, covering 200 miles in eight days before being picked up by another SAS patrol. Such incidents were not publicized because of the SAS's obsession with secrecy, but rumors of its work and the toughness of men like Silito were spreading throughout the 8th Army. As the pursuit of Rommel across Libya continued, a new campaign opened at the other end of North Africa. On the 8th of November 1942, Anglo-US forces landed in French Northwest Africa. They quickly subdued the Vichy French forces there, bringing Morocco and Algeria into the Allied camp. The Allies then advanced into Tunisia to engage the Axis troops, which were being hastily deployed from Europe. Hopes that Tunisia might be quickly secured proved false, and the Allies were faced with a winter campaign in the west of the country, while Montgomery closed in from the east. The SAS now began to operate in Tunisia, again concentrating on Rommel's supply lines as he withdrew from neighboring Libya. But disaster struck. Sterling and his party were lying up in some scrub when they were surrounded by Germans. After a firefight, some men were able to escape, but David Sterling was captured. The reputation of the Phantom Major, as the Germans now called him, had grown to such proportions that he was imprisoned in Colditz, the supposedly escape-proof castle where he spent the remainder of the war. The loss of David Sterling, the man who had founded and inspired the SAS, was a grievous blow. But the successes of the unit he had founded and the effect that its raids were having on the Germans and Italians meant that there was no question that it would continue its operations. In fact, while the campaign in Tunisia continued into 1943 and the Axis forces were being ground down, Sterling's capture led to a reorganization of the SAS. It was divided into two. One part became the Special Boat Squadron, under the Earl Jellicoe, son of the Admiral who had commanded the British fleet at the Battle of Jutland in 1916. Paddy Main took command of the other, which was renamed the Special Raiding Squadron. Among the new recruits for Jellicoe's SPS was Lieutenant Anders Larsen, a Danish merchant seaman who arrived in Britain at the end of 1940. He had joined a secret commando unit, 
the small-scale raiding force and had distinguished himself in a number of cross-channel raids. When this was disbanded, he was posted to the SBS. The Allies now turned across the Mediterranean. Sicily was invaded on the 10th of July. Paddy Main's SRS was ordered to take an Italian coastal battery before the main assault. They not only did this, but also captured another battery. 48 hours later, the SRS landed again and captured the town of Augusta, holding it until relieved by the main force. A new SAS unit, 2 SAS regiment, was also involved in the invasion of Sicily. This had been formed in northwest Africa by David Sterling's brother, Bill. One section of 2 SAS was assigned to capture a prominent lighthouse on D-Day. This proved easy, as it turned out to be undefended. Another section of 2 SAS was parachuted in small groups to disrupt Axis communications, the SAS's original role. The drop, however, was scattered, and many of those taking part had not been in combat before. Little was achieved. In early September 1943, the SRS supported Montgomery's landings in the toe of Italy by capturing the town of Bagnara and holding it for three days until relieved. This was followed by a more elaborate operation. Paddy Main's men landed with two commando units behind the German lines at Termoli on the Adriatic coast. Simultaneously, elements of two SAS landed at Taranto, led by Major Roy Farron, a cavalryman who was a veteran of the tank battles in the desert and the fighting on Crete. Farron then moved northwards with his jeeps and linked up with Paddy Main at Termoli. The two groups and the commandos held the port until relieved. These operations showed that the SAS could operate closely with conventional forces, as well as on its own. While this was going on, two other groups of two SAS were dropped in northern Italy to cut railway lines in an operation codenamed Speedwell. After blowing a number of bridges and viaducts, the raiders made epic treks through the mountains of Italy to reach the Allied lines further south. SAS operations continued in January 1944 in support of an attempt to outflank the formidable German defences of the Gustav Line. The Allies landed at Anzio, to the southwest of the Italian capital and further groups of two SAS were dropped behind the lines to attack German communications in the region. In the event, this counted for little, as the Allies failed to exploit their initial success by rapidly advancing inland, and the Germans were able to contain the beachhead. While the SAS was operating in Italy, Earl Jellico and the Special Boat Squadron had been busy in the Aegean, often using fishing boats as transport. In one of the few SAS operations that was actually filmed, the SBS took advantage of the Italian surrender in September 1943 to make landings on islands in the Dodecanese, bringing the Italian garrisons onto their side. Further reinforcements were sent, but the British lacked the resources to sustain the garrisons on the islands. The Germans launched attacks on them and seized them back, one by one, during the first half of 1944. The SBS suffered a number of casualties during these attacks, but continued its raiding operations in the Aegean. 
In the spring of 1944, the SAS was enlarged to brigade size and concentrated in Britain to prepare for the invasion of France. The special raiding squadron became one SAS regiment and two SAS was brought back from Italy in March. The original French troop was augmented by two parachute battalions and became three and four SAS regiments. With the addition of a Belgian parachute company as five SAS, the special air service was now some 2,500 men strong. Their task was to be dropped into central France and cooperate there with the French secret army, the Marquis, in attacks on German communications. The first SAS teams were deployed during the early hours of D-Day. The woods and forests in the area proved excellent cover for the SAS teams and their jeeps. Using intelligence gathered by the Maquis, SAS jeep patrols mounted numerous attacks on German bases. A favorite tactic was to drive at speed through a German-occupied village, blasting away at houses being used as billets or storage. These raids helped to tie down German troops who could have otherwise been sent to join the battle in Normandy. One group was given the unusual job of assassinating Rommel at his HQ in northern France. They dropped on the 25th of July, not realizing that Rommel had been badly wounded in an air attack a week earlier and was back in Germany. The Germans reacted to the SAS attacks by mounting sweeps of the woods in which they were hiding. Sometimes the SAS was caught by surprise and had to fight desperate rearguard actions as they tried to extricate themselves. One group of 35 SAS men operating in the Poitiers region in early July 1944 were totally surrounded. Almost all those who survived the firefight that followed were captured. One wounded SAS man was beaten to death with rifle butts, while 30 others, together with an American airman, were shot in cold blood. In spite of disasters like this, the SAS operations in the French countryside played their part in disrupting the German rear areas and helping the Allied breakout from Normandy and subsequent rapid advance across France. But with the liberation of France, the scope for independent operations deep in enemy territory declined dramatically, especially once the Allied advance slowed because of overstretched supply lines. It seemed to some in the British High Command that the SAS no longer had a relevant role. Partly to deflect these, an SAS squadron returned to Italy in the autumn of 1944. There was more scope for the type of operation they excelled in, and small parties were dropped in the north of the country to assist the partisans. The SAS men helped to carry out attacks on communications, although German retaliation was often bitter. The SBS enjoyed a happier time towards the end of 1944, when they took part in the liberation of the Greek mainland. But despite these attempts to find useful employment for it, by the beginning of 1945, the future of the SAS was looking doubtful. One squadron was selected for counterintelligence duties in Germany, especially hunting down war criminals. One and two SAS were earmarked for the liberation of Norway, but the Allied strategy was to leave the large German garrison there until after Germany itself had been overrun. In the meantime, there seemed to be little for the SAS to do. 
In March 1945, Brigadier Mike Calvert took command of the SAS Brigade. As a veteran of the Chindit operations in Burma, he was an expert in deep penetration raiding and a forceful advocate for his new troops. After much debate, he obtained agreement that they should spearhead the advance of 21st Army Group east of the Rhine. Five squadrons took part in the final advance, acting as screening forces for the 1st Canadian and 2nd British armies. But the lightly armoured SAS jeeps were very vulnerable to ambushes and suffered a number of casualties. It was in one of these ambushes that the redoubtable Paddy Main had his last fight of the war. He came to the rescue of one of his patrols which was in trouble and forced the Germans to withdraw through the ferocity of his fire. This earned Main his fourth distinguished service order. The SAS jeep patrols finally reached the German naval base at Kiel. As the men gazed in amazement at the destruction caused by Allied bombing to the port and the naval vessels based there, other SAS patrols were sweeping east and north as the war came to an end. The Special Boat Squadron was also involved in the final Allied offensive in Italy in April 1945. One of its members, Anders Larsen, now a major, carried out raiding operations on Lake Comacchio. During these he won the SAS's only Victoria Cross for covering the withdrawal of his men under heavy fire until he was killed. Larsen had already won three military crosses and he was deeply mourned by all who had known this outstanding officer. As the war ended, one and two SAS, together with the brigade headquarters and paratroopers, were sent as anticipated to Norway to oversee the disarming of the German forces there. Despite its professionalism and skills, the authorities did not envisage a role for the SAS in the post-war British Army, and by the end of 1945, it had been completely disbanded. But this was not the end of the story, for the SAS was reborn during the 12-year campaign against communist terrorists in Malaysia. The regiment reassumed its role of long-range penetration, developing techniques for parachuting into the jungle. Subsequent campaigns took the SAS to the barren wastes of South Arabia, where it gave active support to the Sultan of Oman in his fight against Marxist insurgents who threatened to overcome the country. The SAS trained the local tribesmen and led them in battle against the rebels. During the 1982 Falklands campaign, the SAS carried out an operation only too familiar to those who had served with it in North Africa 40 years before. This was the highly successful raid on the Argentine airstrip on Pebble Island, before the British landings on East Falkland. The SAS men gained total surprise and succeeded in destroying six Pukara and four Turbo Mentor ground attack aircraft and a Skyvan transport plane. The raid left the Argentines without any aircraft on the islands to attack the landings when they took place four days later. A decade later, the SAS was back in the desert and again operating deep behind enemy lines, this time in Iraq during the 1991 Gulf War. 
In an extraordinary replay of the battles 50 years earlier, in which it had won its spurs, the SAS used Land Rovers as well as helicopters to disrupt Iraqi communications. A more modern task was hunting down the Scud rocket launchers with which Saddam Hussein was threatening his neighbors. In the years since 1945, the SAS has taken on a variety of new roles, especially in the field of counter-terrorism in Northern Ireland, when it carried out numerous covert surveillance operations as well as ambushes. The regiment has remained true to the principles developed by David Sterling and the other founder members in the deserts of Egypt and Libya. Its men continue to wear its famous beige beret and winged dagger cap badge with pride. And competition to get into the regiment is fierce, with only a small number of applicants being accepted. Its actions have almost always been carried out in complete secrecy. The taking of the Iranian embassy being the only time that its troops have ever been seen in action. Above all, the SAS maintains the spirit encapsulated in its motto, coined by David Sterling in the desert in 1941. Who dares wins. Thank you.